Before I get started, I just wanted to take a moment to thank everyone for your attendance. I know that most of us have probably made quite a few adjustments to our work and home life these past few months, so I appreciate that you're taking time out of your day to join us. My name is Brooke Hochelle, and I'm a scientist within the Scientific Operations Organization at Waters. I'm excited for the opportunity to present some tips and tricks for how to develop more efficient methods for ion pair reverse phase analysis of oligonucleotides. I'm going to begin by first providing a short introduction to set the stage for what types of oligos will be discussed throughout this presentation, and then I'll touch on some of the tools that are available for achieving our separation goals. The majority of the presentation will then focus on method development in terms of what considerations need to be made when selecting an ion pairing agent, and then that's going to transition nicely to a case study where again we'll need to consider less traditional approaches for achieving our desired results. For today's presentation, our focus will be on synthetic oligonucleotides in approximately the 20 to 30 mer range, which have the structure shown on the right. Synthetic oligos are synthesized through an iterative four-step synthesis process that adds nucleotides sequentially until the desired product is made. Although this process is well understood and can be carried out efficiently, impurity profiling is still going to be the major analytical challenge that we're faced with with these types of samples. Based on the oligo structure, hydrophobicity of the bases, and the negatively charged phosphate backbone are going to lend themselves to three modes of LC that can be used for analysis. Although the nucleobases can contribute some degree of hydrophobicity, reverse phase is probably more commonly used to separate or purify DMT on from DMT off species that result from synthesis. Anion exchange is, of course, a charge-based technique, and while useful, it does not lend itself to MS should that be a requirement for our analysis. Ion pair reverse phase is by far the most common technique, especially when MS is required, and it's what we're going to focus on for today. In ion pair reverse phase, both the backbone and the bases will impact the separation. This slide shows the amount of desired full-length product that would be produced at various synthesis coupling efficiencies, and this helps to explain why impurity profiling is such a challenge. The routine coupling efficiency reported by industry is really good, but it's not perfect. So if you consider that you have a 20 to 30 mer species and the coupling efficiency is 99.5%, your target purity is only around 90%. So you can imagine as your oligonucleotide length gets longer or your coupling efficiency is not quite as good that you're gonna see a drastic decline in target purity. So for this reason, it becomes really important to achieve good separation so that we can better characterize and understand our impurity profile. Before we go into further details of how to select an ion pairing agent, let's consider a few tools that can aid in our separations. Oligo separations are generally run under elevated temperatures and a high pH, which is a problem for the silica stationary phases that were the dominant stationary phase used for reverse phase analysis up until about 20 years ago. Although silica is favored for its high efficiency and mechanical strength, high pH hydrolyzes silica particles and leaves voids in the pack bed. Bridged ethylene hybrid, or BEH technology, launched in 2005 brought in the operable pH from 1 to 12 at elevated temperatures without compromising column performance and lifetime. The BH particles are prepared from two highly pure monomers that form an ethylene bridge copolymer distributed uniformly throughout the backbone. These oligo BH columns will be used throughout the presentation. This figure demonstrates the stability of the BH particles under high pH. An accelerated high pH test was done to compare BH technology to silica-based columns. Columns were equilibrated with TEA containing mobile phase buffered to pH 10 at 50 C for the number of hours indicated at the bottom of the figure. During this time, columns were periodically flushed with water and methanol, and efficiency was tested using a hydrocarbon analyte. The lifetime of the BH columns exceeded the best silica-based columns by an order of magnitude. 
Next, we always recommend that you run a standard to establish benchmarking. If your instrument has been idle for an extended period of time, or you're working with samples that you don't know how they will perform, you should always verify that your standard performs as expected. Waters has a mass prep oligonucleotide standard available that's a poly T ladder composed of 15, 20, 25, 30, and 35 MERS species. And it is the same standard that's used to QC test every batch of oligonucleotide BEH columns. Whichever mobile phase system you choose to pursue, you should always use LCMS grade solvents and additives when available, specifically when MS analysis is required. Because of the negatively charged phosphate backbone, MS is typically run in negative mode, which results in the presence of sodium and potassium adducts. If you're familiar with a LEGO MS, you know that this is a really big problem. Here we have 99.8% pure HFIP on the left and 99% pure HFIP on the right. And although it should be noted that different vendors assay their reagents differently, it's clear in this case that the lower purity additive is much more susceptible to adduct formation. Now that we've covered some column chemistry and mobile phase basics, let's start to go through some considerations that should be made when selecting an ion pairing agent. Ultimately, selectivity and resolution are going to be impacted by your choice. Allow me to highlight just a few from the table. TEAA is the most traditional ion pairing agent used, especially for optical based assays. Since the introduction of HFIP as a counter ion, TEA HFIP is regarded as the most effective ion pairing agent for single stranded oligo analysis in terms of achieving optimal LCMS sensitivity and resolution. Another consideration you need to make is whether or not your mobile phase should be denaturing or not. And although TEA HFIP is the gold standard for MS analysis, it is a denaturing mobile phase, which may or may not be desired. So at a very basic level, we want to achieve desired chromatographic resolution, MS compatibility if our analysis requires it, and we need to consider whether or not our mobile phase should be denaturing or non-denaturing. In ion pair reverse phase, the retention mechanism is governed by the ion pairing between the charged oligo and the ion pairing agent. In TEAA, the positive charge on the triethyl ammonium ion forms a positively charged layer on the surface of the stationary phase, and it interacts with the negatively charged phosphate backbone of the oligo. So by increasing the organic concentration, the ion pairing agent desorbs and the analyte is eluded. The weak hydrophobicity of the bases can also contribute to retention. On the left, the oligonucleotide standard shows poor selectivity, especially in the case of the longer oligos, so we cannot resolve the failed sequences. However, when we incorporate an ion pairing agent, like on the chromatogram on the right, we can see that the resolution is greatly improved. Here we have a 30 MERS species run using TEA buffered in both acetate and HFIP. An obvious difference between these two chromatograms is the inability of TEAA to separate all of the failed sequences compared to TEA-HFIP. TEAA, which is a less efficient ion pairing agent, shows changes in selectivity and even has some coelutions. For a successful LCMS analysis of synthetic oligos, the mobile phase has to be compatible with MS. This slide compares the signal from an infusion of an oligo that was desalted prior to the experiment and TEAA on the top and TEA HFIP on the bottom. The primary cause of ion suppression is due to the acetate in TEAA, so whereas the TEAA buffer severely reduces the signal, TEA HFIP does not appear to suppress oligonucleotide ionization. The best signal to noise, of course, is then achieved with TEA HFIP. One of the major factors that we need to consider is whether or not we should use a denaturing mobile phase. 
In the case of G-rich oligonucleotide sequences, they're known to form very stable inter- and intramolecular structure, which can make analysis by reverse phase challenging. So generally, either a really high pH or a high temperature is required for analysis. However, because TEA-HFIP is an effective denaturant, uh, you can see that in this case we have length-dependent retention. Although TEA-HFIP is the gold standard for LCMS analysis, LCMS-grade HFIP can be very expensive and it can also sometimes be difficult to find a reliable supplier. In this example, butylamine and dibutylamine were used to show comparable MS results while using up to 20 times less reagent. Concentration of the alternative amines was held constant at 15 millimolar and HFIP was adjusted to provide the optimal MS response. Separation conditions were tuned to achieve a similar elution profile, but you can see that similar selectivity was achieved in each case. Note the amount of HFIP used also is going to affect the pH of the buffer. Where lower concentrations of HFIP are used, the pH is going to be higher. So this again is going to be a really nice example of where traditional silica-based columns would be a concern, but the BEH technology enables the use of alternative amines. A stability test using a 30-minute method was used to evaluate column performance for serial injections over 200 hours at pH 9 and 60 C. Reproducible results can be seen in the chromatograms with little variability in retention time and chromatographic resolution of the N-1 species highlighted. The average peak width across the five standards is plotted on the right, and the RSD for each of the individual standards was calculated to be less than 1.5% in each case. We have already established that selecting an ion pairing agent and counter ion is critical, specifically in the case of LC and MS performance. There may also be some additional considerations like cost, which could be a purchase and also removal, toxicity, and whether or not you desire denaturing or non-denaturing conditions. Ultimately, we want to ensure efficient ion pairing, and that will look to achieve a length-based separation, resolution of all oligo sequences, and minimal hydrophobic contribution. So now let's consider some applications where an alternative ion pairing system may be more suitable based on your application. For our earlier discussion, we focused on TEAA as a traditional approach and TEA-HFIP as the MS-friendly buffer system. In this example, the same oligonucleotide standard, the poly-T ladder, was used to investigate peak capacity across a variety of buffer systems. From comparing TEAA on the right to two different HFIP concentrations on the left, uh, it's clear that HFIP has greater peak capacity across the LIGOs of all length. In exploring different buffering systems, one thing that was observed was that when using hexylamine or dihexylamine as the ion pairing agent, that there was a slight improvement in peak capacity for the 30 to 35 mer species. So if you refer to the dashed line, even though this might not look like a huge difference, it still led us to ask the question, can this effect be further exploited when working with larger oligos? In this example, HAA was compared to TEA-HFIP for the separation of a 60 to 80 mer DT ladder. Gradient times were adjusted so that the 60 and 80 mers eluded at approximately the same time so that it would provide the most direct comparison between the two. So from the chromatograms, it is clear that the larger species are more resolved in HAA. We have already discussed the need to consider whether or not a denaturing or non-denaturing mobile phase is appropriate for your analysis. In the case of the G-rich species, HFIP was used as an effective denaturant for eliminating inter- and intramolecular complexes. For duplexes, however, a non-denaturing mobile phase is better suited for maintaining duplex structure. Single-stranded oligos are usually run at 60 C to denature the oligo with no impact on secondary structure. Double-stranded DNA and RNA, on the other hand, is typically run below 40 C.
On the left, we have our ion pairing agent buffered in acetate, and at 40C, we can see that it's probably just starting to denature the analyte. At 45 and 50C, the sample is completely denatured. However, if we compare this to our ion pairing agent buffered in HFIP on the right, we can see that HFIP accelerates this denaturing process, and even at 20C in this case, the analyte is starting to melt. In this example, HAA is used to resolve RNA duplexes. A full-length upper RNA strand and partially digested lower RNA strand were annealed to form the duplexes shown on the left with the associated chromatography of the individual strands on the right. So you can see from the truncated lower strand, a ladder of N-1, N-2, et cetera, um, species are formed. From the chromatography on the bottom right of the anneal duplex, we can see that HAA successfully resolves the duplex containing deletion sequences from the full length duplex. MS was used in this case to further confirm the elution order of the failed sequences. So now that we've explored the effects of different ion pairing agents, let's apply these principles in a case study. This work is going to evaluate impurities in fluorescently labeled synthetic oligos. These labeled oligos are going to be more applicable probably in the research and diagnostic space, but if we take into account our discussion up until this point, you can hopefully envision that even in the therapeutic space, as therapeutic oligos become more heavily modified and their analysis becomes more complex, that it becomes necessary to consider less conventional approaches. We have already established that when using TEA HFIP for separation of our oligonucleotide standard, that we would expect that our main species would elute, followed by N-1, N-2 impurities, and so on, and that these failed sequences will elute in order. But the reality is that when we work with more complex species like this dye conjugate, that it imparts such a high degree of hydrophobicity that the elution order is impacted. So here we have a 25 mer species with a Psi-3 dye conjugated, and the N-1, N-2, and N-3 impurities were all synthesized and spiked into the sample at equal amounts. And in this case, we can see that the failed, or failed sequences co-elute and have a later elution time than the main peak. By using hexyl ammonium acetate, which is going to be a stronger ion pairing agent than TEA-HFIP, the separation once again becomes length-based. Hexylamine provides more efficient ion pairing through more effective adsorption to the reverse phase stationary phase than TEA due to the length of the alkyl chain. But the problem with using HAA in place of TEA HFIP is that it is not MS compatible. This data was collected using a single quad detector and when the tick and raw data are placed on the same scale, the same sample load is barely distinguishable from the noise in HAA. The deconvoluted data is almost three orders of magnitude greater intensity in TEA HFIP. Ion suppression is observed largely due to the acetate counter ion versus HFIP, but it should also be noted that HAA is not available in LCMS grade, and although, again, different vendors can assay their reagents differently, there are clearly more adducts in this case. HAA was further investigated in a more systematic manner by comparing MS response in TEA HFIP to HAA. This table reports the signal to noise ratio determined from the average peak intensity from the tick across three injections from a dilution series of the N-1 impurity. TEA HFIP approaches a limit of detection of approximately one nanogram, whereas a mass load greater than 60 nanograms is barely distinguishable in HAA. These results are all within the recommended loading conditions of the column. Although we can load more analyte on the column, we need to be mindful of the shark fin effect where resolution is lost due to overload. In the case of TEA HFIP, when we load more material, we actually lose linearity in the dynamic range because the upper data points become saturated. This becomes a really nice example of where 2D can potentially offer a solution. 
HAA in the first dimension can offer the desired separation where TEA, HFIP, and the second dimension can provide mass information. There's been a pretty steady increase of 2DLC use across the pharmaceutical industry, and there's a number of different drivers for that. The first is that we incre can increase selectivity by using orthogonality in our first and second dimension to increase our design space. We can also increase resolution for highly complex samples that need more resolving power. We can enable MS compatibility for methods which are not compatible with MS. And we can also increase sensitivity for analytes facing ion suppression or for those that need to be removed from complex matrices. Today, we're gonna to focus on heart cut mode, which works to transfer discrete fraction to the second dimension for analysis. From the image, peaks two and three are partially coalluded in the first dimension, and by transferring them to the second dimension, we can tailor the second dimension gradient to further resolve them. This is going to be in contrast to comprehensive 2DLC, which sends fractions of the entire 1D chromatogram to the second dimension for analysis. So how do we do that? Although you can, of course, purchase a new system dedicated specifically to 2D, you can also transition your existing 1D workflow to a 2D workflow, workflow with a few module considerations. Here, a secondary pump is incorporated for the second dimension separation, and the column manager that's used must be equipped with valve switching functionality. Optional 1D and 2D detectors can be used, and then once the system's configured, you can go between 1D and 2D as needed. From the schematic at the bottom, at a fundamental level, 2DLC is going to be comprised of two independent flow paths that are connected via a valve assembly, and that valve assembly is going to facilitate transfer of a fraction between the flow paths, and that can be done either using trap or loop variants. This transferred fraction is then subject to separation on the second dimension column. Method development requires optimization of both the first and second dimension separations. In the first dimension, we want HAA for a length dependent separation and the second dimension should be MS compatible. Final conditions are shown in the table. So you can see that the same column chemistry is actually used in both the first and second dimension. So any changes in selectivity that we're gonna see are due entirely to the mobile phase that we're using. In the first dimension, a long shallow gradient is used to tease out impurities, and because the second dimension is basically a desalting step, a more rapid gradient can be used. These next few slides will show the flow path used for the 2D system configuration. Two two-position six-port valves are used to enable heart cut functionality. When the valves are in position one, the flow paths are going to be isolated from one another. You can see that flow is directed from the first dimension quat pump through the first dimension column into an optical detector. Once the analyte of interest begins to elute off the first dimension column, the valves are switched to position two to selectively transfer the analyte to the second dimension. So there's a lot to take in here but the flow path from the first dimension is shown in blue and the flow path from the second dimension is shown in pink and where they combine and meet is shown in purple. At column dilution or ACD is going to work to dilute the organic content that was required to elute the analyte in the first dimension so that it can be retained on the head of the second dimension column. The flow paths are once again separated by switching the valves back to position one. The second dimension pump now drives the separation in the second dimension. A proof of concept experiment was used to evaluate the 2D system. The N minus one impurity was spiked into the full length product at approximately 10% and that was determined by integrating the optical trace in the top figure. When the N-1 impurity started to elute, it was transferred to the second dimension. The corresponding second dimension tick was used to confirm the mass of the N-1 peak that you can see from the deconvoluted data. The broad peak at about 12 and a half minutes in the tick is attributed to mobile phase from the first dimension passing through the second dimension column from the heart cut when the flow paths are combined. 
The same method was applied to a more realistic sample, the labeled 25 mer, without the spiked in impurity. So in this case, the resulting impurities are from the synthesis process and they were not removed from the vendor's HPLC purification process. So we're going to be limited by the purity of what the vendor is able to provide us with. The impurity in this case was approximately 2.4%, which was determined again from integrating the optical trace. From the 1D dilution series, the lower limit of detection approaches about 1.5%, so this suggests that sensitivity is not lost in transitioning a 1D method to a 2D method. To summarize, the oligonucleotide chemical synthesis process can generate impurities that can be difficult to separate due to their similarity to the full-length product. Ion pair reverse phase is the most commonly used technique for separation and purification, where selection of an ion pairing agent and buffering acid is critical. TEA-HFIP is the gold standard for LCMS analysis, and it can be used successfully in many applications, but hopefully I've shown that there are times when you need to consider alternative approaches. From the case study, it was shown that selecting an ion pairing agent truly is a balance of requiring good chromatographic performance and good MS performance. I would like to thank my colleagues for their many contributions, and I would like to thank you for your kind attention.